Lachina, how's it going? Kevin, I am doing well, all things considered. How are you? We're doing good here in uh, Winston-Salem. Glad to see that you are healthy and staying safe. And so glad that you could take some time out to uh, talk to Deacon Nation on our podcast, Deek to Deek. Appreciate you taking the time out for that. Uh, and so a lot of our fans know you from playing basketball and being an analyst, but we want to go back and start from the beginning and learn a little bit more about La China and what it was like growing up. So you were, uh, you're from um, Alexandria, Virginia. You grew up there. What was that like growing up? Well, Kevin, first of all, you don't have to thank me because anything you ask for, I am 99% likely to say yes. You are one of my favorite demon deacons and it just, I am delighted to see that you have this platform. I think it's awesome. And when I found out you were coming back to the athletic department, I was just so thrilled, um, not only for you as a friend, but for uh, our Wake Forest family. So very, very, very good to see your face and to be here with you. Um, so growing up in Alexandria, Virginia, wow. So I was born in Boston, Massachusetts. That's actually where my mother was born and raised. Um, and she actually graduated from high school at 16 years old. She graduated early, ended up going to school at GW, which brought her to the DC area. And for those that don't know where Alexandria is, it's about 15 minutes from DC, if that. Actually, it's like 10. <laughs> so, um, you know, I obviously don't remember a ton of the early days. I, my mother said we actually lived in DC in my first couple of years of life, but Alexandria is most famous for the movie, Remember the Titans, if you have ever seen it, which if you have not, I'm embarrassed for you. Um, but that was my high school, TC Williams High School. Um, Coach Boone, Herman Boone, who Denzel Washington portrayed in that movie was my driver's ed teacher. So. Yes. One. Yes, I know. You, you, if you're listening to this podcast, you can't see Kevin's eyes, which are huge right now. So that's what we're most known for in Alexandria, in Alexandria, Virginia. But I grew up, my mom was a single mother for most of my childhood. It was me. I had an older sister, two younger sister, and a younger brother. You're playing in high school, right? Playing basketball, but you don't start out playing basketball. Uh, as an athlete, you started out as a cheerleader, right? I did. Um, <laughs> so for a good part of my childhood, my mother would tell you that I didn't know I was tall, right? Like she said she would just put dresses on me that my older sister could no longer fit, hand-me-downs, everyone's got them. And she was five years older than me, so she's thinking, of course I'll be able to fit this dress, and none of the dresses ever fit me. She was like, I don't know why this is so short on you. Hadn't come to, to mind from my mom, who's 5'10", she's pretty tall, but my dad is 6'4". Needless to say, I was, I had the longest legs. I mean, my cheerleading skirt was, was not doing me any justice. So um, over time, cheerleading when you're six four or hitting six foot becomes cumbersome. <laughs> um, I couldn't do the little cartwheels. I was always on the bottom of the base of the pyramid. So um, it just, and, and I think I was playing, I was cheerleading mostly because that's what my friends were doing. Like I wanted to do what everyone else was, you know the popular thing. And I had tried basketball when I was in the sixth grade and I was like, eh, not for me. My mom was like, yeah, they're stepping on your feet and um, your hair sweating out. Like that's not what we're doing. Cause we hadn't had a lot of female athletes in my, in my mom's side of the family. My sister would go on to play basketball in high school, which was influential for me, but um, you know, so we were good. You know, I like to watch TV. I would sit at home, paint my nails. That was me. But when I turned 14, I was six foot four. And this guy in our community named Michael J used to come to my house all the time. And he would tell my mom, she needs to play basketball. She should be playing basketball. And my mom's like, no, you know, China's good. She's going to focus on her academics. I played the violin. Like we were set until he came to my house one day and said, do you know, she could get a college scholarship? Well, my mom pretty much dropped me off at practice the next day and never came back to get me. She was all about education. And hearing that I could get a full scholarship, if I did not want to play basketball, she didn't care. Um, it was going to happen. And eventually, you know, um, I grew to love it. I was more of a competitor than I was a basketball lover. But being 6'4 at 14 years old, there are not a lot of places that you feel like you fit in the world. I had a low self-esteem as a teenage girl. I was taller than all the boys. 
But on the basketball court, I realized, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is a place where I feel empowered as a young girl um, in a space where I learned to communicate and, and, and do a lot of things and just mature as a young woman. So it was the perfect sport for me for a variety of reasons. Well, when did you know that, hey, I'm pretty, I'm really good at this? <laughs> it's funny you say that because I was not very good for a long time. Um, I started, this, this is never anyone's story, right? I actually started on the freshman team. I played JV and then I played two years of varsity. That just doesn't happen and you end up at a division one school. Most players start off on varsity because you're so much better than everyone else was not my story. Uh, it took me a while to develop. I, I wasn't, I wasn't very good. Um, and then I guess I realized maybe my, my senior going into my senior year, I was like, okay, this college scholarship thing may actually happen because I played on a team where my, my teammates were getting offers from Virginia tech and, you know, they were going to big division one schools. And I remember the moment that I was like, okay, maybe I'm, a, I, I can do this was Bonnie, Bonnie Hendrickson was the head coach of Virginia tech women's basketball. And one of my teammates was going there and she said, Hey, Bonnie wanted me to tell you that you had a great game the other day. And I was like, she said, what? Like just the fact. And at that time, Virginia tech women's basketball was a, is a, was a very good program. So when she said that as a division one head coach, I was like, okay, I might be all right. Um, and I had been getting letters um, leading up to that, but I, I don't think I ever really thought I was, I was good. So you're going through this process. Uh, now you're getting this attention. What was it about Wake Forest and how did Wake come into the picture? What was it about Wake? Yeah, that's a good question, Kevin. So um, I started getting letters and, you know, was looking at a number of schools. And I think my schools had come down to Clemson, Wake, Florida A&M, and James Madison. And the way Wake fell into that group was I was, I mean, my mom and I were, very impressed by Charlene Curtis. Um, can you imagine the number of black women that were head coaches in, in a power five conference? Like that was something that was extremely impressive to us. Um, just the thought of having a woman in a leadership position that looked like me every day and could help me not only grow as a basketball player, but as a person, a young woman, like that was just something that caught our attention. But after I went on my visit, so my visits went JMU, Clemson, Wake, and then I was supposed to go to Florida A&M. Florida A&M was very attractive to me because I thought I wanted to be a lawyer at the time and they have a great law school. Wake Forest was interesting because of Charlene, but also, you know, we had heard about the size of the school and so many different things. So we were, we're getting ready to go on our visits and I go to Clemson and Jim Davis is the head coach at the time for women's basketball. They had an outstanding team, probably some of their best teams at, at this time. And I left my official visit and I was like, I'm going to Clemson. And my mother was like, oh, but we still have Wake Forest in Florida A&M Florida that we need to get to. And I was like, oh no, I'm going to Clemson. I mean, they took me into Death Valley and all the fans and Ipte and all that, you know, it was the chance and all. I mean, I was in that football stadium, like in awe. And we had a night game too. And we couldn't do night games at my high school because we didn't have lights. So I was in there like, okay, I'm going to Clemson. And I loved, you know, Jim Davis and, and, and all the girls on the team at the time. So my mother was like, I think we should at least do one more visit and, and see. So I went on my visit at Wake Forest to Wake Forest and I don't know how I had this. I, I don't, I'm not sure how I had this level of awareness at, I was probably 16 at that time, but I felt like Wake Forest was where I needed to be. And what I meant by that was I felt a calming feeling the first time I stepped on campus, I felt safe. Um, I really felt a connection to everyone that I met and after meeting the, the team, you know, uh, uh, Alicia Mosley was my host and yeah, Mose was my host. I met Cynthia Kelly. Um, you know, they took me, they ended up taking me over to Winston-Salem State. So they kind of, you know, they kind of fooled me a little bit because they took me to Winston-Salem State because obviously there weren't a lot of people that looked like me on Wake Forest campus. So I was like, well, where are all the black men and women, you know? <laughs> 
Um, and so they took me over to Winston-Salem State and we hung out for like a homecoming event or something. So I was like, okay, I can get into this, you know? So I, I saw that I was going to have some cultural experience, which, you know, Wake Forest didn't have that necessarily on campus, but what it did have was um, an intimate academic environment. I mean, the student to teacher ratio, I knew I was going to be in small classes. I really liked the dorms. The campus was captivating. And um, again, Charlene Curtis and, and the opportunity to come in and make a difference. You know, Wake Forest had not had a good year the year before, and I knew I could come in and play. And that was one of the most important things to me. Clemson, I wasn't going to crack the lineup for a good two years, probably. Um, but I knew I had a chance to do something special at Wake. So not only did you get a chance to play, I mean, that first year you come in and you make uh, all ACC freshman team. I mean, what was that like? That was probably, you know, you asked me earlier, when did I know that I could be pretty good? That was probably the moment, you know, after my freshman year and I got, when I made the all rookie team, I was shocked. I was like, I did? <laughs> like, <laughs> Cause I felt like I was always chasing something. And maybe that's the reason why, you know, I, I had success in that season in particular was like, okay, I came in to Wake Forest scared to death. I was like, I'm going to do everything I'm supposed to be doing in here. You know, I ended up making the Dean's list. I didn't want to get kicked out of school. I, my mother had already made it clear. See, I tried to go home during fall break. I, I went home for a visit. I told my mother, I was like, you know, I don't know if Wake Forest is, is the place for me because I couldn't make my mile time. I did not want to run that mile test again. And my mother was like, LaChina, you're going back to school. She was not one of those you can transfer moms. She was like, you are going back to school. So you might as well stop crying. We already gave up your room. And so I had had a little rough fall coming into it. So to be able to make my mile and end up starting was just a testament to hard work, you know, and I started to learn what the value of hard work was. I didn't know that in high school, but you get to college and you say, okay, I work hard and I can get Dean's list and I work hard and I can maybe start, I work hard and I can, you know, make the all freshman team. Like it felt good to accomplish those things. Um, so it was, it came by a little bit of a surprise, but um, it's something that I'm definitely proud of that I was able to come in right away and have success both on the court and in the classroom. Now, you, you talked about coming to Wake that freshman year, and obviously you had a great impact, and uh, Coach Charlene Curtis being there. What was it like playing for her? Yeah, you know, Coach Curtis was different. She was very... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? She was, I played, I guess, let me set the stage. So when I was in high school and AAU, I played for very emotional coaches. They were both men, but they were emotional. Um, Mr. Hagen, who was Coach Hagen, who re God rest his soul, would wear the bottom of his little shoes out. I mean, he was very, you know, he was stomping. He was, you know, very demonstrative and, um, Fred Priester, who's a high school coach still in, in Oakton, even more so. I mean, he was just a fireball. Charlene was very calm and very intentional about her teaching technique, about how she wanted us to present ourselves on and off the court. Um, she was just very businesslike. Probably the first coach I had that treated me like a real adult who was like, okay, LaChina, here are my expectations. <laughs> you know, if you fall in line, you have a good chance of success. You'll stay on my good list. If not, we're, we're going to have some problems. And it was just like, okay, so I have a choice, which was exciting now that I'm an adult. Um, and luckily, you know, I pretty much fell in line for the most part. But um, again, just to see her as a black woman, as a role model, um, you know, and to learn the game from her. Like I didn't know anything about the mental side of basketball, the IQ side. So I was eager to get to practice every day because I was learning so much about, about, about basketball and how I could have an impact on the team. What was that team atmosphere like? I mean, you, you, yeah. you come oh, in, you're a freshman, uh, you're having the success on and off the court, but what was that team chemistry and camaraderie like when you were there oh man we had a lot of fun like there were some times I, I think we had a big group of freshmen there were like six of us that came in so we were almost like our own team and there was also a big group of um, freshmen on the men's side so it was like Craig Dawson and Antoine Scott and Darius Sungalia and we were Broderick Hicks 
So we were like, there were like 12 of us when we all decided we wanted to go to Benson to get a cheeseburger. There were like 12 of us together. So we were, we, we used to get together at night and like go play pickup basketball against the guys. So we were, we were close as just a freshman class. And I stayed in Johnson, Johnson Hall. And um, my roommate was Elizabeth Bedrecki, who, uh, who ended up um, transferring out. But um, yeah, our group was very close knit. It was myself, um, Adele Harris, Val Klopfer, Eliz uh, Elizabeth, what is her, what was her college name? Uh, Elizabeth Rogers, um, Letitia Pearson, who was one of my best friends during school and Elizabeth P Bedrecki. I think that's all six of us. So um, yeah, we were close. And as a team, we, we had a lot of fun. We used to dance in the locker room. Cisco was big back then. So we would dance to Cisco in the locker room. And um, Brenda Mocker Patrick was quite a, she was definitely in the locker room um, more um, outgoing as a dancer and as a personality than she maybe was on campus. <laughs> and then we had Olivia Darty, who you know was a character in, in, in itself and could put on a show. So we had a very fun team of, of a lot of big personalities. And we took, we took cool trips. Like we went to California. And that was the other thing that I thought was cool that Coach Curtis did is we always had an educational experience when we traveled. Um, when we went to California, we went to Alcatraz, we went to New York. Um, I mean, we went to a lot of different places. I think that was when I went to my first Broadway play and um, we had a lot of experiences. So it was a good time. Now you talk about your teammates and their personalities. Now I heard that you had a great, you have a great personality yourself, but you're going to have to explain to myself and Deacon Nation who was called the jukebox and why. <laughs> That was me. I was definitely the jukebox on the team. Um, I know the words even still today to like every song. Um, and I loved music. I have always loved music. So they always knew no matter what song they were going to put on, I would be able to spit out the words. So they started to call me jukebox. It's like, we put a, we put a quarter in you and you just start saying all the lyrics, all the sounds, all the, all the music. So I was often the um, the person that got the party started from a music standpoint because I, I knew all I knew all the songs. So, oh. and now I don't know any songs. <laughs> <laughs> can you? Oh, nothing. Can you hear me now? Oh yeah, I can hear you. I, for some reason, I can't hear. Oh, all right. So you're on the team. Uh, I want to ask you this: Who was that player? that you had to get up for. Now you're a competitor and I know that you get it up for everybody, but was there that player that you knew that you just really had to get it up and play against? Who was that player? In the conference? Yes. Oof. It doesn't even take me long. There were two. There was Summer Herb who ended up being, I'm pretty sure an All-American at NC State, played for Coach Yao. She was her number was three, but she was by far the biggest girl on the court. She was probably six, 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 seven, easily 240 pounds. And then there was Michelle Van Gorp, who played for Duke. And she was six, 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 seven, and looked like the Ru Russian boxer from Rocky. Like that's, she literally had like this blonde hair and was in great shape. And let me tell you, when I had to defend those two and they both went on, you know, they had very successful careers or in the record books at both NC State and Duke. But I often had to ask them during the game, like, do you even know I'm back here? Like <laughs> the number of buckets that they both scored on me. I mean, Summer Herb was a big girl, just use her body well. She would just turn and hook shot right over me. And Van Gorp was like, I mean, she had a turnaround jump shot. They were, they were so skilled and uh, I just looked up to both of them and the way, you know, they use their footwork in the post, just how dominant they were night in and night out. I knew my work was going to be cut out for me. In fact, one time at Duke, I literally was crying at halftime. It was probably my freshman year. I would never do that again. But I was like, what? I basically, I looked at Coach Curtis and I said, what do you want me to do with her? Like, she had like 30 on me by the time halftime. It was like, what else can I do? Here I am, this skimpy freshman. But uh, those were two players that I knew I had to be at my best for night in and night out. 
Now, LaChana, you talk about balancing and obviously having that success on and off the court, but how did you do it? Because, you know, the average person doesn't know how tight and strenuous the schedule is for a student athlete. Mm -hmm. So what did you do to kind of balance yourself to make sure you were having, continuing to have that success on and off the court? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, it definitely starts with the level of expectation around you. And so whether it's your coach's expectations or your teammates or your academic advisor, like I, I knew that college was not a place where I need to show up and fall out of line. Like I, I needed to, um, you know, come in and, and really be focused and not be a problem. Like I never wanted to embarrass my parents. That was the other thing was like my parents, how they felt about me meant everything. And I always wanted to make them proud. So there were just, those were the internal motivators of just wanting to make my family proud, you know, become the first college graduate. Because what I didn't tell you is even though my mom has five kids, my dad actually has 12 kids. And Right. So I'm, if you take me out of both sides, I'm one of 15 children. And so <laughs> I know a uh, long story that I would have to tell on Oprah one day, I, not, not for this podcast. Um, so, and my dad did not even graduate from high school. So for me to go on and be the first college graduate out of all those children was something that meant a lot to me, but you know, we had people that just were the guardrails for us along the line. Like we had a great Along, along the way, we had a great coaching staff. Stephanie Yelton was, had a, made a huge impact on me. She was our post coach, but also kind of like the go-to player on the staff. I mean, you don't understand how important it is when you're leaving home for the first time to have someone on the staff that you can identify with, that you can go to, that you can talk to, you feel close with that, whether, whether it's on the court or it's a personal family issue that you have someone that cares for you. So that was that was part of the experience is finding those people and then you had like the I think our first academic advisor maybe your last name was Kinlaw and then Jane Caldwell came in and she was our academic advisor so um we you know just had people in place that were there if we needed them but I will say one of my regrets from my time at Wake was that I felt like I was so sucked into the athletic experience that I didn't take advantage of things that were happening at other places on campus. So yes, I was having success on the classroom and on the, on the basketball court, but there's so much more to life. There's so much more to the growth process as a young adult, um, whether it's your character or your career aspirations or, you know, your community cares, which we actually had um, two great professors in sociology, Dr. Hattery and Dr. Earl Smith, who were fantastic with growing us in, in some of those aspects. But um, I wish I had branched out, you know, I could have been on Wake Forest government, you know, student government, something like that. I, you know, I, I didn't get my feet wet enough. So that is one regret, but it was, um, you know, Wake, Wake makes it easy for you to stay focused because of the, the support that you get. So with that and having that support to be successful, both on and off the court, is that one of the things that you feel is uh, continue to be a driving force to attract people to Wake Forest? Because, you know, they're consistently one of the top 30 universities in the country when you look at it as a whole and then athletically with the growth in facilities and how the different programs uh, continue again to meet expectations and exceed, exceed expectations. Do you see that continue to be a draw for young student athletes, that balance of academic uh, excellence as well as athletic excellence? No doubt. I mean, one of the driving forces, which is the foundation for everything you just said, Kevin, academically and athletically is the size of Wake Forest. Like it's so intimate and you feel very close to everyone on campus. I mean, we, we, we used to go and shag uh, balls for field hockey. We were close to the field hockey team. And, you know, we knew people in the pit. Like, we knew all the servers and everyone in the pit. Like, there was no one on campus that we didn't know. And so it really felt like a family in a lot of ways because of the intimacy, which 
Same thing in the classroom. You're, you're going to be seen if you raise your hand. You go somewhere like NC State or Carolina, where there's 40,000 people on campus, you're a number. And yes, you're an athlete, but you want to be cared for in so many different ways than that. And so that's one of the biggest reasons why I knew Wake Forest was the right place for me is because I, I wasn't going to get lost. I wasn't going to be a number. I wasn't just going to be another face because on this campus, you just, it's simply so hard to, to lose people and to lose touch. And, you know, even, even the girls in our dorm, like I had a roommate who was a regular student. Her name was Marla. Oh, we used to have a blast. Like we were, we had a good time. I know I'm trying to think of her last name. I see your face, Marla. I can't remember, but I'm gonna come back to that. Um, yeah, like, but, but she was exposing me to what regular student life was like at Wake Forest. And so there were just a lot of touch points there that um, stand out to me. And, um, but yeah, I definitely think Wake Forest excellence, both academically um, and athletically was no doubt a, a big reason why I was attracted to go there, attracted to Wake Forest, but also why I was able to have success. So what is your favorite Deacon moment that you were a part of? Beating Carolina. I think we beat them twice when I was there. Once Adele made a couple of free throws to ice the game, but um, that was my senior year. Um, those were always uh, the most memorable moments. And then, you know, whenever something major happened and we roll the quad, you know, Wake Chapel, um, we had a, actually hosted a debate on campus, a presidential debate my junior year, I believe. I mean, what an experience. You know, I remember going to Wade Chapel and listening to speakers from all over the world. They would always bring in great people. And so I just had a very full and whole experience. I mean, when I think about what my, my favorite Deacon moment was, I mean, there's just so many. It definitely starts with beat, beating Carolina, but um, just the, the traditions. You know, like I said, the events at, at Wake Chapel, rolling the quad, um, I don't know. Those are some that just stand out in my mind, but definitely anytime you beat Carolina, it's fun. <laughs> now you kind of cap things off a little bit by making the academic all ACC team just to continue that dominance, uh, in the classroom and on the court. So when you finished up at Wake, you started pursuing a career in uh, college sports administration, right? Mm -hmm. yes. And what kind of, what pointed you in, in that direction? Right. That's a good question, Kevin, because I did not know what I was going to do when my basketball career was over. I probably showed up at the basketball office the next day and like, hey, y'all, I'm here. And they were like, and you want us to do what? Like, <laughs> because your, your life is so scheduled for four years. Like you show up at the gym and then you're going to um, study hall and then you know we're loading the bus at this time and all of a sudden no one's telling you where to be and you're not gonna have a roof over your head in about two months when you graduate so I kicked it into overdrive I knew I wanted to stay close to sport like I had just fallen in love with the college athletic experience so I wanted to stay close to sport but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do and um, thankful for the athletic department and for the academic department, I was exposed to the, uh, what was then the futures internships at the ACC office. And there were a series of internships that they were doing at the time. I don't know if they still have them, but they were for seniors who were competing in, in the ACC. And I ended up going to, and they were a variety. There was like broadcasting. One was at the ACC office like there were these different relationships with the ACC office that they had with the various schools that were providing internships with some kind of entity that's close to the school so there was a whole list of them but um, I wasn't thinking about the broadcast <laughs> opportunity interestingly enough um, I went and did my interviews um, and I think I did them at the ACC office um, the spring of my senior year. And when I left, they were like, okay, we'll call you and tell you which internship you got. Cause there were probably like eight or nine of them. And they called me and they said, you have your pick. Cause everybody, everyone picked you first. And I was like, what? So imagine you go to your first job interview. I mean, I worked when I was 14, but it was at a little African, um, African craft store that my mother owned. And she was going to hire me just because she was my mother's friend. So this was my real first job. 
And um, so I left and I was like, gosh, which one should I do? And I, and I picked working at the ACC office because I was intrigued by how do you guys put these championships together and what's happening behind the scenes. So I was a championships intern at the ACC. And that's when I met John Swafford and his wife, Nora, and uh, Bernie McGlade, who was there at the time. Shane Lyons was there then, who is now at West Virginia. He's the athletic director there. Amy Huckthausen who is the commissioner of the America East Conference was working there. So I was surrounded by people that were, I didn't know it at the time, but they were getting ready to be big time college athletics, you know, people. And um, Davis Whitfield was my immediate um, boss or supervisor. And so as the championships intern, I got to travel to every school in the ACC and help to put on championships. And it was so fun. You know, there was a, there was a, a business side of it, but also being at the actual championships was cool. And so that sparked my interest in athletic administration. And I ended up getting my first full-time job um, from my internship uh, down at Georgia Tech. Mary McElroy was there and I had done a championship and worked with her a little bit. And she had an opening on the women's basketball staff, but it was on the administrative side. And she called me and I was like, you know what, Mary, I think I want to be an AD one day. So if you can help me get there, um, I'm on board. And now Mary's actually back at the ACC working in the conference office, but that's how I got into athletic administration. Now, how did you transition to becoming an analyst and getting in front of the camera and calling games and covering events and things like that? How did that happen with such a focus on the administrative side? Well, my degree from Wake was in sociology. And the way that I landed on that was because I came in thinking I was going to be a lawyer. And then I was like, oh, this is way too much reading and writing. This is not, I'm not going to be able to do this right now. Um, and then, because I just wanted to show up at the courtroom. You know, of course, I didn't want to do any of the, of the, the groundwork. And so then I thought I wanted to be a psychology major because I wanted to have people come and lay on the couch and tell me about their problems took the intro class, barely made it out. So that was a no. And when I started to read more about the curriculum of sociology, I was like, okay, this sounds great. I was gonna be taking classes like um, race and sport and um, social inequality and marriage and the family. I was like, oh, this sounds great. So I ended up majoring in sociology, which I am so happy I did just because I had an I had an outstanding academic experience with that as my major with, with the leadership of the sociology department at that time and some of our professors. Um, and so it didn't make a lot of sense for me to be thinking about broadcasting, <laughs> like, right, with a sociology degree. But after I had been in admin administration for about seven years, it just was not lighting my fire. Right. Because I would see athletic directors. Now, keep in mind, I was like 27 years old at this time and they were, you know, they were business people. And I was like, I don't want to be in a suit every day and, um, you know, sign paperwork. It looks so boring to me as a 26 year old. And I didn't want to coach. I had thought about that. And I was like, oh, no, recruiting. Soon as someone tells me, no, I'm so passionate and competitive. I'm, I'm going to be crying. I'm going to be devastated. So. I had started doing the radio for Georgia Tech, um, just, you know, something to do because when the team was playing, I was usually, you know, my work was done. I would do game operations and stuff. But when they were actually on the court, I just watch. And the day I put on the headset, Kevin, I was like, okay, this is something that I could see myself doing for a very long time. Now, how do I get into it? And I, there's no magic formula and everyone that gets into this business and eventually works for someone like ESPN, like even saying it now just sounds crazy knowing what my aspirations were starting out, but they'll tell you there's just no formula for getting into broadcasting. For me, it was beating the pavement. I mean, I networked my buns off. I volunteered. I shadowed. I met people. Anytime there was an analyst doing a Georgia Tech game, I was trying to sit in the seat next to them and find out what they were doing, how they were doing it. I was in the truck, figuring out how things worked on that end. I was taking any job opportunity I could to get reps, no matter how small the game, no matter if they were gonna pay me or not. Now I was doing all this while I still had my full-time job at Georgia Tech with the support of the then head coach, Michelle Joseph and our administration, Teresa Wenzel and some others. They knew what I was trying to do. So they were very supportive of that, which was, was helpful. But I was just, 
I knew, Kevin, it's like the life purpose thing when God says, this is what you're supposed to be doing. And I'm like, "Uh uh-uh. He's like, yes. I just needed to continue to move in the direction because I love the game. You know, Pat Summit used to say, we need to get more games on television. I was like, well, how can I be a part of that? Like I now had a purpose. You know, my purpose was to bring attention to women's sports because I wanted to do women's basketball. It was to add a faith of color to the coverage of sports, which they weren't a lot of black women covering, uh, you know, college basketball, WNBA at that time. Like I I now had a purpose that was beyond just do I like my job? It was this is how I can have an impact on the lives of the people coming after me. So I was willing to put in the work and really just grind and hustle and do everything that I needed to do to get my foot in the door. And so with that, has come a lot of success opportunities. Again, you mentioned with uh, ESPN, uh, Georgia Tech. Now you're with the Atlanta Dream and you've covered the WNBA All-Star game. I mean, you've covered everything. Like how many, if you had to guess, how many games have you covered? Oh gosh. (laughs) If I had to guess, shoot. I would say, and this is just a guess. Let's see, this is year. So I started at my first game in 2009 on ESPN and it was at Madison Square Garden. So that's what I knew God had to be involved because I was like, okay, there is no way this is my first game. It was at Madison Square Garden and it was a double header with Pat Summit, um, Vivian Stringer. Yes, my first ESPN game. Pat Summit versus Vivian Stringer and it was Baylor versus Boston College. I was, I was like, okay. How many people had to get sick for me to get this game? But anyway, so that was 2009. So let's see, 10, 11, 12. My math isn't great. So that was 12 years. I would probably say I've done somewhere around a thousand games. Yeah, worked at least a thousand at this point. Cause I, yeah. Now, what was your toughest interview? Like the one that you were just, it just was just, it was a struggle because oftentimes you'll see the um, interviews with at halftime or Mm -hmm. at some point and you're you're talking with the coach and it's always the team that's losing where you get the most difficult. So uh, maybe not in that situation, but just overall, what was your toughest interview that you had? And, And you don't have to say the person's name if you don't want to. But, um, oh, I will say the name. It is Cheryl Reed. She's the head coach of the Minnesota Lynx. And she is the pop of the WNBA. Like, she will give you the shortest response. I've had her actually not come to, I've been standing outside of her huddle, waiting for her to do the interview, and she she wouldn't come. Um, It is one of the most humiliating things that can happen to you in-game. In-game, interviews are so tough. I don't think people understand because coaches don't want to talk to you. You know, they're all, they want to coach their team. They want to focus on the game. And it's a great tool because you allow the fan inside the coach's mind for those few moments. But, uh, Shell Reeve, who has given me the cold shoulder on a number of occasions. So, and, you know, I mean, you always have the Gino Oriemas and the, and the Kim Mulkeys and, you know, those are always tough just because those people in their basketball minds, I mean, they're the, they're the greats of the game, Tara Vanderveer, and you want to sound smart and you want to be, you know, so those are pressure filled interviews, but my toughest are always the people that are not in a good mood. And I've had a couple of those with coach Muffin McGraw too. I've had a couple where she has, she's never left me standing, but she hasn't been a happy camper when she's gotten to that microphone. So but um, I never take offense to it. It's it's always, you know, business as usual. So I want to talk about some of the moments on your end, maybe some of the ones that didn't go so well and were very funny. Did you have any, like some of your biggest bloopers? Yes. I remember the first time I interviewed Robin Roberts. I was a joke. Like, first of all, I had not done very many interviews at this time. And she was way down in like, the smallest town of Georgia doing, she was part of a dedication for a woman's um, roast. 
So she was going to be speaking. And someone was like, okay, we're driving three hours outside of Georgia because Robin Roberts is going to be there. This is probably the only time we'll ever have access to her. So I drove down. And when I look at, when I listen to the interview now, I am like, but I literally started talking and I think she could tell I was struggling. So Robin kind of took over the interview. She's so comfortable in her own skin. I mean, that woman is life goals. She knows who she is. She knows, I mean, she's just so good at what she does. So she literally took the interview from me just about. <laughs> and I didn't know that at the time. I was just so in awe of her. But when I went back and watched, I was like, wait, this was supposed to be my interview. But it was actually very kind of her because it, it turned out well, but um she, she definitely had to step, step in and take over. And then, um, I mean, I've had interviews where I've, you know, definitely stumbled over my words, which I hate doing, but I realize it's just a human thing. Um, I've had some where I forgot my, my question. I've never asked, I've never called a coach the wrong thing. I'm trying to think about player wise. I once interviewed Charles Barkley and he made fun of, he actually came to the, did the halftime of one of our WNBA games and he was, he was totally like his jokes were so over my head at that time. I was probably like 20, I don't know, early, late twenties. And, and he was just throwing all kinds of stuff at me. So um, nothing else that really stands out, but I did get to interview Kobe Bryant a couple of times. And so those interviews were meant a lot to me and probably somewhere I was my most nervous. <laughs> Now, with with this being a part of your career, as with this, you know, your career going in this direction as an analyst and a broadcaster, doing so much for the game, you also have a passion. You mentioned it earlier for uh, helping young women and inspire young women. If you don't mind, kind of spend some time talking with us about Stretch Beyond and rising media stars. Yeah, so I started Stretch Beyond when I was leaving Georgia Tech to get into broadcasting because I was excited about this new career, but I felt like I wanted to keep a foot in the door of student athlete development because that's the, the space that really tugged at my heart. You know, when you get into athletic administration, you can get into, um, you know, finance, business operations, academics, compliance. Well, it was about student athlete development for me. It was like, how can we better develop student athletes in terms of their career aspirations, their community aspirations and their character. So that was why I created Stretch Beyond because I wanted to still have a way through my own business, that's the way it ended up working, to um, work with student athletes. You know, I, I really wanted to help them through the types of things that I was facing at that time of life and in particular how to transition into their next phase of life, whether it's their brand or finding their career after sport, those kind of things. So Stretch Beyond has um, grown a lot, started in 2008. And I've used that as kind of like a jumping off point for a lot of the um, speaking engagements that I've done with, um, whether it's with um, women led organizations or organizations and companies that support women advancement. Um, or in you know, different sports arenas. I mean, I, I've done a ton of that kind of work, panel moderating, any of that um, I, was, I was interested in. Cause I like, to, I like to have conversations with people and I love to learn and facilitate. I learned how to be a facilitator actually from the NCAA. So I've done a lot of that work at Stretch Beyond. I do media training for colleges and universities. Um, so even these days I'm still doing it. I mean, I was, I've, I've been at Notre Dame and I've gone to, University of Florida, like I've worked with a lot of colleges um, in that space. So, and then Rising Media Stars is a nonprofit that I'm the co-founder of with a guy named Kevin Nixon. And what that is, is we um, bring in five young women every year, women of color, and give them skills, resources, training to help them transition into sports broadcasting. So our mission was to try to further diversify sports broadcasting, to have more women of color in that space. And I knew how hard it was for me to transition into. I know how difficult it can be for Black women to um, make their mark and to make the right contacts and to find the resources to get their shot. And so we partnered with uh, the, some of the professional teams in the city of Atlanta, the Hawks, the Falcons, uh, the United and the Dream, 
these young women actually come to Atlanta and work these events as reporters where we get to give them experience doing stand-ups, doing halftime reports. They're in the locker room for interviews. So we're really grateful for the partnerships with our, with our teams here because that's really what makes it work. But um, I just wanted to reach back and help young women that may be in a situation that I found myself in of having this dream and not knowing how to go about it and, and hopefully helping them to live their dream like I'm living mine. Now, you also have a great podcast that I love listening to called Huge Fan. Uh, t- tell Deacon Nation about that. What is, what is that about? And where can we find it at? Yeah, so Huge Fan was something I was a little bit nervous about when I was approached by Sirius XM. Um, they are the brainchild behind this idea. I can't take any credit for it. But what Huge Fan Podcast is, is it's a place where we bring in celebrities. I'm the host. And we bring in different celebrity personalities to talk about their fandom. So for example, Tim McGraw came on the show and we talk about the LSU Tigers or uh, Ashley Judd came on huge fan with me to talk about the Kentucky Wildcats. Um, Nellie came on to talk about the St. Louis Cardinals. So it's all of these different celebrities because you don't think about them being huge sports fans and they are the biggest. Like Michael Buble is a Canucks fan and he has an ice rink in his basement. Like that's how crazy it is. Oh yeah, they are huge fans. So that's why we call it huge fan. And um, I was a little nervous at first because I don't work with a lot of celebrities. I work with mostly athletes. And then, you know, I was going to be, I was like, am I going to be expected to know about hockey and football and all these other, and they were like, we just want you to interview. Like, that's the biggest thing. We want you to bring your passion and to bring your ability to connect with whoever you're talking to, bring that to the podcast. You don't have to be the expert. So I was like, oh, that's cool. Like, I'm so used to people wanting me to come in and be the basketball expert. If I don't have to be the expert, okay, this is great. So um, you can find it on SiriusXM app. They've just launched a bunch of original content podcasts. It's their first um, podcast launch ever as as SiriusXM. And they're partnering with Pandora, obviously, um, who I believe they either have a partnership or or SiriusXM um, acquired. But either way, you can find it on the Pandora app as well as SiriusXM. And it does come on during the week on on XM, but I'm not sure of the channel. I should know that, but (laughs) it's a great pod. So... Tell us about the experience in the bubble. Well, the wobble, is that the, which one is wobble? Yeah, what, what was that like? Yes, so <clears throat> as everyone knows, this past summer, there was a lot of conversation on whether or not there would be a WNBA season, whether the NBA would resume. And um, I've been covering the WNBA since 2008 and I cover, the, I cover it now for ESPN. And so, We didn't know if there was going to be a season because of COVID, um, honestly, because of what was happening with the racial reckoning in our country um, for a number of reasons. Um, But they decided to move forward with a condensed 22 uh, game season. And ESPN, we came in and thanks to Carol Stiff, who's one of the VPs at ESPN, we picked up a ton of the WNBA games because we had you know, everybody's at home. We've got this space on TV, which because not all sports were active. And so um, we got to showcase the best women's basketball players in the world. But I was actually in Connecticut covering it. We weren't in the bubble. Holly Rowe was the only ESPN person that was in the bubble because the WNBA, different from the NBA, didn't allow media into their bubble in Bradenton. Only Holly Rowe. She was the only national media person there so I was in Connecticut during the season I spent like two and a half months there and I would call games from studio in Bristol with Pam Ward and then um, Rebecca Lobo and Ryan uh, Ryan Rucco are our other crew but covering this summer was so different because of what the WNBA players were doing from a social justice standpoint it was well beyond what I would be doing as just a basketball analyst we had a chance to expose the world to what these 144, you know, a few of them decided to opt out, but 144 women of the WNBA were doing to use their platform for good, to, to speak up for issues of social justice, whether it be against police brutality or uh, voting, you know, rights, encouraging people to vote, 
Um, they dedicated this season to the Black Lives Matter campaign and also the Say Her Name campaign, which specifically um, was geared toward remembering the women who have been victims of police violence who are often forgotten, like Breonna Taylor. So what the WNBA did in Bradenton was something that was historic. Um, they also started the movement that eventually got Reverend Warnock elected into the Georgia Senate. Um, it was athlete activism like we have never seen it. And it was really, really cool to be a part of. So with that experience that you've had in, in covering the game, but particularly 2020, having to incorporate so many of the social justice issues that are going, just, the, just issues in, in general, do you want to branch out beyond just covering the game and cover other things or are you kind of, you know, good where you are? Oh, I'm always open to the intersection of sport and culture, sport and society, sport. And I mean, even in just, I've always, part of my brand is basketball, but the other part, people know this, I'm an advocate for women. Um, I'm an advocate for black and brown women in particular who are often the voiceless and the marginalized in our country that I represent. So I am always down to use my voice, my platform, um, whatever it is I can to engage people in conversations around my experience in this world versus your experience. If I'm speaking to someone who's of the majority race, you know, a black, uh, white or man or woman. So um, anything that's in those crosshairs, I'm always down for it. Now, do I see myself stepping away as a basketball analyst to do any of that like full time? Not right now, but um, I'm enjoying being able to incorporate that and bring uh, those worlds together because when it comes to human and civil rights, we all have to be engaged and there is no room for an apathetic attitude. Um, I think one thing I learned last summer was just that there's a, there's a way of thinking that if it doesn't affect me, I don't need to be worried about it. But um, I just hope that we get to a place as a country that we realize, as Martin Luther King says, an injustice to any way, uh, wait, it's injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere. Um, so, and I probably messed up MLK's words, but you guys know what I'm saying. Um, we have to care about everyone as humans and each other as people, whether the issues that are happening are um, directly impacting us or not. That's how we're going to get better. So lastly, you, you know, I notice you, you're back on campus whenever you get an opportunity, checking out the games, checking out uh, the facilities. Have you had a chance to visit the Sutton Sports Performance Center and the Shaw Basketball Complex yet? And, and if you have, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, man, I am so excited about all the changes to the facilities on campus. And I want to give a shout out to Jen Hoover because she has been awesome in getting us as alumni engaged and making us feel invited. So I've been to campus on, on a several occasions and a shout out to, to Mike Piscitelli as well, who is someone who always pulls me in, keeps me connected. Um, you know, and also I will say, as soon as John Curry got the job, he, he sent me a text and I was extremely impressed with his welcoming um, disposition as well um, as, our, as our new athletics director. So I have several touch points um, including you, Kevin, keeping me engaged and making me feel like Wake Forest is home. So when I, when I come back to campus, I'm always looking like, what's going on? What construction is happening? I was the happiest person in the world when there was some construction happening over at the athletic department. <laughs> and I can see some buzzing in, in, in construction. I was like, okay, so we're, something's getting ready to happen here. But no, I had received early communication and a heads up because um, at that time I was on the um, athletic Advisory Council that the Sutton Performance Center was coming, that the Shaw Basketball Facility was coming. And I just, I did an early tour and I just overjoyed because these are facilities that not only are going to make us more competitive in recruiting, but that we needed at Wake Forest. I mean, the weight room now versus the weight room when I was there, I'm like, <laughs> it's, I can't even, it just gives me great pride to see 
how much the student athlete experience has grown and the commitment by Wake Forest to really take care of the total athlete. It wasn't just, we're gonna have a new weight room. It was like, okay, this is where we're gonna handle nutrition. And this is where you can go to get recovery. All these things that you don't realize when you're a student athlete are very important to your success. And so um, I travel a lot in, in college athletics. I've been to probably 80% of the power five conference schools. I would say a good 80%. Um, and during my travels, I used to work for the Big Ten Network. So I've been to all those schools. Like I've been everywhere. And what we have done to upgrade um, the facilities with the Sutton Performance uh, Center and the Shaw Basketball Center are some of the best I've seen in the country. And I don't say that because I'm a Wake Forest grad. I say that because it was done with great detail and class and the facilities are, are really beautiful and, and something that we can all be proud of. LaChana, thank you so, so much for being on the Deep to Deep podcast. It's always wonderful having a chance to talk to you and catch up with you. And when things uh, open back up, we got to have you back on campus to, you know, meet some of the student athletes and share your experience and your wisdom with them. Uh, again, thank you so much for being a part of this and taking time out because I know you have a, a busy schedule and, and you're doing so many things and got your hands in so many pots. So thank you so much for that. Anytime, Kevin. Like I said, anything for you. And uh, last but not least, go Deeks.